I've kind of reversed aging biologically, my chronological age is 37, and currently my, my biological age based on telomere measurements is 20. You should structure your day so that by the end of the day, exercise is an option, not a necessity, because we know from data the amount of turbulence and the amount of resistance to blood flow that occurs from a hard workout after being sedentary all day long could actually increase your risk for high blood pressure or for heart attacks or for other issues during exercise. So the presence of mild hormetic stressors spread throughout the day, including sunlight radiation, exposure to heat, exposure to cold, exposure to hunger, exposure to digestive stress or body stress from the intake of body, mind empowerment. Get stronger, faster, smarter, quicker, friendlier, more helpful, more driven. Everything the body needs. Control your mind. Welcome to the Body and Mind Apartment Podcast. I'm your host Seamland and our guest today is Ben Greenfield. Ben is one of the leading experts in the world of biohacking and health. He has one of the top fitness podcasts called the Ben Greenfield Fitness Show. He does public speaking, runs Spartan races, writes books and does many other things related to optimal living. Ben, I'm glad that you could make it to the show. Hey, thanks for having me on, dude. Definitely. I can see that uh, you're using uh, your walking treadmill desk. So are there any other uh, biohacks that you're currently doing? Like right now I'm walking on the treadmill? Um, yeah. Sure. I, I could name two. I, uh, I've got a, an ICS M1 PEMF device on my wrist because I actually have a race this weekend and I'm dealing with a wrist sprain from a little car accident. These, these PEMF devices are really good mm. at uh, shutting down chronic inflammation and improving healing of bone and tissue. So I, uh, I'm doing pulsed electromagnetic field therapy on my wrist. And um, what else would I be doing right now that I can tell you? Any, any supplements? Uh, breakfast. Yeah, breakfast this morning was just a couple servings of ketone esters and about 20 uh, grams of essential amino acids. So you know, kind of, sort of in a fasted state, you know, that allows you to maintain a fasted state and be somewhat anabolic, mm. or at least uh, allows you to keep your appetite satiated, get some of the anti-inflammatory benefits of the ketone esters and also some of the neurotransmitter and the, in the uh, gut healing and joint healing benefits of the amino acids. And then um, my workout this morning was a little uh, hypoxic training session on my, uh, on my bike with a unit called a Live O2, which basically extracts air from the room and concentrates it in an oxygen concentrator. And then you can, with the flip of a switch, kind of flip back and forth between low ox, excuse me, low oxygen and high oxygen. And then for the blood building benefits, I like to, to kind of heat myself up going back and forth from hypoxia to hyperoxia with some intervals. And then I finish up with about, 20 minutes or so in the infrared sauna, uh, which I came out of about a half hour ago and, uh, do a quick cold plunge to make sure I'm not sweating all morning. Um, so yeah, those, those are a few of the little things I, I was up to today. Yeah. Another day at the office. <laughs> What's that? Another day at the office. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, another day at the office, <laughs> living the dream. But uh, you've been recently, yeah, uh, been doing a lot of these other crazier or let's say less conventional biohacks as well, like uh, uh, stem cells, NAD injections, and uh, some other <laughs> some other things related to you know, dick enhancement and so on. So, can you do you want to talk about it or? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I uh, what what do you want to know? Uh, let's maybe like uh, talk about the, the stem cells because I, I feel like those are the biggest ones that people would be interested in in terms of like anti-aging and longevity. Sure. What do you want to know? Well, can you maybe give a brief overview about the procedure of how, what kind of an experiment did you do and what were the results? Well, uh, I've, I've done a little bit with stem cells. You know, the stem cell theory of aging is that you have niches, tissue niches where stem cells reside and that as you age, your, your pluripotent stem cells become uh, more and more exhausted in terms of their availability. And so by replacing those with either autologous stem cells from your own body, such as your bone, 
uh, or you're fat or using a non-autologous stem cell source such as uh, umbilical or amniotic or even placental stem cells, you can replace those stem cells and enhance quality of life as you age. And furthermore, if stem cells are injected into a, an area uh, where there is tissue damage, such as a joint, they assist with repair and recovery of the joint, or even if they are allowed to cross the blood-brain barrier, which they normally wouldn't do, but you can actually, you can induce temporary blood-brain barrier permeability via something like uh, uh, the sugar alcohol mannitol does a good job with that. You can inject that and then inject stem cells and have them cross the blood-brain barrier to work in neural tissue. So there's a lot of uses for something like stem cells. And what I've done is I have had some, uh, some, some disc adjustments and uh, some work done on my back. Following that, I have done a mix of umbilical and amniotic injections into my back. But because it's a foreign protein, may spark an immune reaction and could even carry a virus or a prion or anything like that, I'm, I'm still a little gun shy of umbilical and amniotic. And had I studied it up more at the time, I probably wouldn't have done those injections um, until I'm 100% hmm. satisfied with, with the fact that they're safe. Um, the other things that I've done is I've had a company called Chimer Labs in Florida take placental stem cells, kill off the DNA in the nucleus, and then extract the cellular signaling molecules, the small vesicles called exosomes. And then I've had those mix with my own bone marrow aspirate and pretty much injected into every joint of my body while I was under anesthesia, uh, including cosmetic enhancement, you know, microneedling throughout the face, uh, mixed with my own blood, my uh, what's called platelet-rich plasma, which is a very common procedure for cosmetic enhancement, uh, sexual enhancement injected into the, the corpus cavernosum and head of the penis, and then also all of the joints. So that protocol was done by, it's called a full body stem cell makeover. That's done by a clinic in Park City, Utah, run by doctors Harry Adelson and Amy Killen. Hmm. Uh, and in addition to that, I've had, uh, I've had my bone stem cells stored uh, at a company called Forever Labs in Berkeley and my fat stem cells stored at a company called the U.S. Stem Cell Clinic in Florida. And particularly from the U.S. Stem Cell Clinic, I've had my stem cells shipped to me uh, I got a concussion last year and I did that IV into the bloodstream with the mannitol to assist with healing from recovery for my brain. I've also injured a couple of joints that I wanted to speed up healing for most notably my knee, uh, and also my elbow. And I've gotten stem cells shipped up to me and been able to have those via the, the supervision of a physician injected into those joints. And then finally, for the anti-aging effect I alluded to earlier, I've had stem cells over the past couple of years administered via an intravenous injection or infusion into the blood. So those are just some of the ways that stem cells can be used. Mm. How, how, how have you felt after these uh, procedures or how fast do you feel the difference? Oh, they definitely speed healing. Even more notably, they speed recovery from workouts. So you bounce back more quickly from workouts. Um, in terms of the TBI and the concussion, a great amount of clear-headedness after getting the stem cells injected. And then uh, sexual performance, primarily length of orgasm and firmness of erection. Mm. Definitely noticed uh, both of those improve markedly. Um, my wife has also had sexual enhancement procedures where she's had stem cells injected into her vagina and her clitoris, which basically kind of keeps those organs from aging as quickly. Mm. Uh, and then she's also done some some facial treatments with stem cells and had her own fat stem cells stored. You know, should she get in a car accident or get a concussion or have anything happen to her similar to me, she has those stem cells available as well. So uh, in terms of telomeres, I've noticed that uh, my telomere length, the, the rate of lengthening of telomeres, which can be measured by companies like SpectraCell or TeloYears or Life Length, um, my telomere length has also uh, decreased in the rate at which it is shortening. Mm -hmm. And so I've kind of reversed aging biologically. My chronological age is 37 
and currently my my biological age based on telomere measurements is 20. Mm-hmm. And most of those more profound changes occurred after I began utilizing stem cells. Mm, yeah, sounds sounds really good <laughs> in terms of like yeah, experiencing uh, second youth almost. Yeah, in a way. Yeah. It, I mean, you know, it's not going to reverse aging or induce immortality, for sure, but for sure. <laughs> at the same time, it definitely improves quality of life or, you know, just faster healing of injuries. Mm-hmm. But there are also like some other ways to promote similar responses like uh, sh- uh, lengthening your telomeres or, or protecting them against, against uh, damage. There are a lot of ways. Yeah. yeah. Uh, a host of compounds can assist with either uh, enhancing telomerase activity, which would be the enzyme that, that keeps uh, telomeres from shortening excessively. Uh, and there are also protocols you can do to increase your stem cell production or your endogenous stem cell health. You know, I talked about pulsed electromagnetic field therapy and how I have that on my wrist right now. Well, if I were to do a PEMF treatment on the long bones of the femur, mm-hmm. that via the marrow in the femur, can induce some amount of stem cell production. As a matter of fact, PEMF was originally developed uh, by a scientist who was working with NASA to research whether or not it could be used to increase stem cell availability. Uh, and so that's that's one way to do it. Another way would be to... Would you, would you use the PEMF um, uh, during sleep as well? For stem cells? Uh, well, while you're sleeping, like using a PEMF mat or some, some sort of a device? Yeah, like- I- yeah, not really for stem cells, but just to enhance delta brainwave production. Yeah, I have a, I have a mat called a body balance designed by Dr. William Pollock. And that's one of the few PEMF mats that will kind of run throughout the night. And so I sleep on that. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so yeah, PEMF can be used in a variety of ways. I, I have a few different PEMF units that I like. Uh, there's also a table made by a company called Pulse Centers that's probably one of the more powerful forms of PEMF. And that one comes with coils. It comes with rings. It comes with pads. And you can pretty much use it as like a doctor on, on anything that goes wrong or you know, I'll even get a massage on it uh, for a couple of hours. And so you, you're you opening and closing cell membranes and enhancing removal of inflammation and increasing the, the influx and efflux of metabolites when you're, when you're on this PEMF table. Mm-hmm. So... In addition to that, a, a few of the quick things you could do to enhance stem cell health, the number one one would be fasting, uh, either intermittent fasting for 12 to 16 hours or a weekly 24-hour fast or even you know two to four times a year, a more extended three to five day restricted calorie fast, very similar to Dr. Walter Longo's protocol in his research where you're eating 600 to 800 calories per day along with water for for a three to five day stretch multiple times during the year. You know, I'm personally a fan of just doing a 12 to 16 hour overnight fast, eating a late breakfast or doing something like I did this morning, you know, just having some ketones or amino acids, Mm -hmm. especially if you've worked out in the morning and then uh, eating, you know, around sometime between 12 and, and two for your first meal of the day. And then in addition to that, wouldn't the amino acids like a break break the fast state or like they're gonna stop autophagy and uh, so on? No, I mean it's like a speed bump. I mean uh, the the anabolic response that you get and the benefits for somebody you know, like me who's an exercise enthusiast as an athlete far outweigh mm. any ability of those to to take you out of a fasted state. I mean okay. it's it's if you take it's like, like I just I just launched a I just launched a bar and people are like oh it's a high carb bar it's got the equivalent yeah. of a freaking teaspoon of honey in it. Yeah. Right. A lot of people yeah. in our industry are way too orthorexic and way too jaded That's and true. very dogmatic and it, to to the extent where, you know, it's it's almost to a fault. So yeah, I mean for me to do a, a workout and a sauna and everything else this morning and have twenty grams of amino acids, I, I would have needed to have eaten close to a hundred grams of amino acids to even get me close to being out of a fasted state. And I've tested blood glucose and I've tested ketones and it's just fine to do mm. something like that. So that's, that's you also have way. to remember that amino acids are different than the amount of calorie you'd find in like whey protein or a steak or eggs or anything like that. It's, it's literally just the constituent amino acids. So very, very non-insulinogenic. They can Anyways, also be produced for, for ketones as well. Some, some BCAs go, go, go to uh, ketogenesis. 
yeah, some of the leucine and the ice leucine and the valine can, uh, can increase right. ketone production. Absolutely. So the other thing would be in addition to a 12 to 16 hour daily fast, you know, what I like to do is just a, a weekly or a bi-monthly 24 hour fast just from like a Saturday dinner to a Sunday dinner. And for me still competing as an athlete, that's about the most I can kind of restrict calories without getting some of the neuroendocrine deficits or the metabolic deficits from excessive calorie restriction Mm -hmm. or excessive fasting. So yeah, fasting is good for stem cells. PEMF is good for stem cells. Um, There's of course, you know, any sirtuin enhancing uh, compound or sirtuin rich food would enhance stem cell production. So your blueberries, dark chocolate, you know, resveratrol, green teas, black currants, uh, you know, any of these type of, of tannic foods or dark foods, those are super helpful. And then there's some, there's some data on colostrum, some on chlorella, uh, aloe vera would be another coffee berry fruit extract, uh, curcumin. And so you could almost kind of make yourself a morning smoothie yeah. with a lot of these compounds that would enhance stem cell health. You combine that with some fasting with some PEMF and, you know, a lot of sirtuin rich foods kind of spread throughout the day. And those are, those are some of the low hanging fruit when it comes to, uh, to stem cell production. Yeah, yeah. So super easy in terms of that. Everyone can simply add these, uh, these compounds and the spices into their, into their mix, into the smoothies, and uh, they're going to be tasting delicious as well. But what, given that we're on the topic of, you know, longevity and anti-aging, what would be the like uh, good diet for, for these, uh, these goals of anti-aging and uh, longevity? Oh, well, that totally depends on genetics. I mean, if you have familial hypercholesteremia or you produce a lot of the AYP1 gene that allows you to digest starches very efficiently, Hmm. or you have a, what would be called like a PPAR gene deficit that would cause you to have a more inflammatory response to say saturated fats or even polyunsaturated fats, you wouldn't be a candidate for a high fat diet Hmm. and would instead, you know, if you have like the APOE44 gene, that'd be another example, or even APOE34 to a certain extent when it comes to saturated fats, which I have, that's why I don't do a lot of coconut oil and butter Hmm. and I eat a lot more monounsaturated Mediterranean fats. But ultimately, what I'm getting at is that there are, there's a lot of people for whom, uh, you know, like a ketotic diet is definitely not a good idea and can cause some health issues or some gut issues or both. Uh, And they would better thrive on like a, you know, like a Ketavan type of diet or a Mediterranean diet higher in starches that are healthy, like sweet potatoes and yams and tubers and coconut starches and some things like that, along with uh, more Mediterranean fats like avocados and olive oils and, and monounsaturates, and to a certain extent, some seeds and nuts. And so uh, it, it really depends. But ultimately, when you look at, for example, you know, the blue zones or areas where there are a lot of longevity hotspots, you do see dietary characteristics that seem pretty prevalent no matter what the macronutrient ratios are. For example, fasting, right? There's always some element of fasting, whether it's a high carb or a high fat diet, some periods of fasting or some periods of caloric restriction seem to induce quite a bit of benefit. Another example would be the intake of a high amount of tannins and a high amount of uh, antioxidants and mild hormetic stressors from wild plants and herbs and spices. Mm -hmm. Right, we see that as prevalent, whether it's a high fat or a high carbohydrate diet. Absence of processed and packaged foods, of course. Absence of rancid vegetable oils, you know, those type of things should go without saying. Yeah. Uh, even if it is a higher carbohydrate diet, it would be a higher carbohydrate diet, lower in rancid vegetable oils or, or processed and packaged foods. Uh, eating together in social situations, such as family dinners or group dinners, that's another prevalent character. Characteristic, and then uh, you see a lot of, um, you know, not a lot of breakfast skipping per se, but kind of like light breakfasts, relatively heavy lunches, uh, especially you know in, in in Ayurvedic protocols where the digestive fires are hot, middle of the day, so you eat your biggest meal of the day, kind of at lunch. A lot of times that's followed by a siesta or a nap, and then dinner is not as light as breakfast, but dinner is moderate. Uh, but it's finished a healthy amount of time prior to bedtime, uh, always kind of finished with some kind of postprandial activity like a walk. 
Yeah. And uh, oh, another characteristic is usually you see some amount of physical activity prior to breakfast. Hmm. Right. So that's kind of the way that, that the day is laid out in many of these blue zones. So those are some of the dietary characteristics that seem prevalent, no matter whether it's high carb or, or ketotic or any variation thereof. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I want to point out this uh, idea that, that, that the people, they eat a wide variety of foods and that they're not, you know, specifically keto or specifically vegan or something. They're, I think like the gut microbiome is so critical in the sense that they, they have the ability to digest a wide variety of foods, like you mentioned, these wild herbs and uh, these different hormetic foods that most Western people, they don't get exposed to almost at all. And that's also one of the reasons why there is so many autoimmune disorders and uh, gut, disgust, gut dysbiosis. Yeah, yeah. D not, only, not only a wide variety of foods, literally hundreds of different foods. Yeah. I think the average American eats something. It's something crazy. It's like, it's like 40 to 60 food groups throughout the year. And when you look at a lot of indigenous populations or hunter-gatherer populations, it's hundreds of different yeah. food groups per year. And in many cases, dirty foods, right? Like foods that still have soil on them or foods that are fresh harvested, or foods that are rich in probiotics or fermented, uh, or even foods that might be parasitic or have, you know, helmets in them. I, I didn't even mention this, but like, you know, I, every three weeks now, I'm actually drinking a small vial of worms from China and worms from Thailand. I'm literally populating my body with some of the old companions that historically our guts would have been populated mm. with and those act as those you know I'm, one's a tapeworm and one's one's a helminthic parasite and both serve as immune system modulators my okay. gut has never felt better good, uh, when when dosing with with these worms that i drink uh once every several weeks so yeah i mean ultimately wide variety of foods and even even dirty foods or things that we might be consider you know things we might consider nasty but you know, look at the animal kingdom and and it's rife with you know, consumption of foods that are not necessarily pristine and clean and wiped down with, with antibacterials or soaked in vinegar. And, you know, of course you need to be careful with herbicides and pesticides, but ultimately, yeah, wide variety of foods and, and even the inclusion of some dirty foods. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's funny to think that culture in the sense of society and, uh, and people, they want to avoid these sorts of things that it's, it's, you know, dirty, it's something to be frowned upon. Whereas in reality, getting exposed to these microbiomes or these microbes is making you more cultured <laughs> on the cellular level and uh, in your gut. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But what do you think about these uh, diets that, you know, neglect, neglect this aspect, like these very confined diets, let's say like the carnivore diet or, or the vegan diet? Oh, we can't really name many populations, at least I can't, maybe you can, that, you know, are still around that have thrived on an all meat diet or, yeah, you, know, you could look at maybe the Seventh Day Adventists in California who have thrived on a on a largely plant based diet. But as far as like cultures and populations that have been around for a long period of time, you know, in most cases you see omnivorous diets. You know, even if meat is moderated, and I didn't mention that as a characteristic when talking about the blue zones, but you certainly see that, right? Like some amount of protein restriction, some amount of meat restriction, and uh, even though I am a fan of that approach. I'm a total omnivore, right? And I will have a large serving of meat usually every two to three days, right? And, and so I, I really think that this dogmatic approach to diet, while it might be fun from an N equals one self-experimentation method to kind of see how you feel and what works for you, I, I still think that an omnivorous diet largely comprised of real foods and very heavy in plants and herbs and spices with some element of fasting and some attention paid to the timing of meals is really the most intelligent way to eat. Yeah, some sort of a food cycling and seasonality mixed into it is like the pro probably the proper way of doing it. I'm glad you brought that up. Yes, this concept of feast famine cycles, this concept of, you know, like I mentioned, the two to four times a year eating a very low calorie diet or even eating, for example, more carbohydrates and fruits in the summer when you're more sensitive to insulin and when you have higher amounts of vitamin D and when those foods are in season and eating more warming foods, more fermented foods, more meats and more fats in the fall and the winter, we certainly see many elements of this type of seasonal eating across a lot of indigenous populations. And so, yeah, I'm very cognizant, you know, of how often I'm doing something like ordering 
coconut milk off Amazon or buying avocados imported from Mexico, my local grocery store. That's, that's yeah. something I'm more and more careful with these days versus simply eating what happens to be seasonal and local around me. You know, right now I'm eating a lot of produce and a lot of beets and lettuces and kale and Swiss chard, bok choy, quite a bit of zucchini and squash and cucumber, um, a lot of fish, uh, the, and, and, uh, but not a lot of eggs, right? And the reason for this is our, our garden is overflowing right now with produce. We're recording this right now uh, in August. Uh, however, the hens, uh, we, have, we have chickens. The hens are, uh, they're hatching. And so we don't have a lot of eggs because the hens are, are breeding and producing chicks. And so you know, that's an example, a very simple example of seasonal eating, right? So I have a lot of produce. I don't have a lot of eggs. There's tons of fish down in the river, right? So, so I know that that fish would be something good for my body at this time of year. I'm not doing a lot of hot foods, all the lighter foods. And um, my wife goes hiking at a park nearby and has been finding a lot of berries. And so I've been doing a lot of berries because those are in season and that's, that's what's around me. And so, you know, that, that's a perfect example of kind of how we can seasonally eat, even in a modern age, just by looking at the clues that nature is giving us and by, you know, resisting the temptation necessarily just buy it because it's available. And don't get me wrong. Like I love to make, let's say like, you know, half an avocado and some collagen and some stevia and some ice, some cinnamon, um, you know, maybe a little dark chocolate and I make myself like a nice ice cream at night, but that's certainly using, you know, half the foods in there really aren't seasonal. Some of them are processed and packaged. Another example would be like what I had for quote, breakfast, unquote, this morning, right? Ketone esters and amino acids, right? So sometimes there's an element of ancestral living combined with better living through science, right? Like I'm okay with both, provided that you make these decisions intelligently. Yeah, yeah. it's funny that you mentioned that uh, we also, we grow our own food and we also have our own chickens and we have the same situation that uh, we don't get that many eggs at the moment and, uh, the, the, and the garden yeah. is full of, full of, you know, greens. So it still yeah, exactly. applies. Yeah, yeah, I like it. Would you like an egg? So, but, but let's maybe talk about the exercise now. Like, what's the best exercise for longevity? A low-level physical movement throughout the day. Mm -hmm. We don't see a lot of exercise like CrossFit wads or triathlon training or things like that in a lot of these blue zones, you know, where there are a large amount of centenarians. They're riding their bicycles. They're gardening, building fences building walls, building homes, moving dirt. Uh, however, living in a post-industrial era, you know, you kind of have to simulate that. Yeah, yeah. I'm walking on a treadmill right now, right? And I have another call after I talk to you where I'll also be walking on my treadmill. And I might walk like this just kind of lightly for three to five miles a day, um, lifting heavy things every once in a while, whether you're working outdoors or you're just kind of keeping a, a hex bar or a deadlifting bar somewhere in your home that you can pick up and set down throughout the day, kind of mm -hmm. sprinkling that type of thing throughout the day. You know, you can have a pull-up bar where every time you walk under the pull-up bar, you do a few pull-ups. But the way I, I like to think about it is unless you're an athlete, unless you're getting a paycheck for exercising, or unless you're finding a great deal of self-satisfaction by training for a marathon or a triathlon or the CrossFit games or an obstacle course race or something like that. And, and I don't judge you if that is the case. I mean, that's how I make my so my profession is I race, you know, and in a lot of these things. So I exercise more than, than what I would admit to be ancestral mm -hmm. or natural. But unless you fall into that category, you should structure your day so that by the end of the day, exercise is an option, not a necessity, mm -hmm. because we know from data that if you exercise hard at the beginning of the day or at the end of the day, but you're sedentary for eight hours in between, you really don't get much of a cardiovascular advantage. And you could even argue that when you're sedentary, the amount of, of uh, and Katie Bowman has some good work on this, a biomechanist, the amount of turbulence and the amount of resistance to blood flow that occurs from a hard workout after being sedentary all day long could actually increase your risk for high blood pressure or for heart attacks or for other issues during exercise. So my recommendation is low level physical activity all day long. Make sure you expose yourself to hormetic stressors like sunlight, radiation, heat, cold, uh, occasionally lifting heavy things, occasionally sprinting, like maybe go check your mail and then sprint back, you know, down the driveway to your house or 
you know, go play soccer or tennis or, or a sport like that. But ultimately, when it comes to hard workout sessions, I really haven't seen any data that those confer longevity. And as a matter of fact, once you exceed about 90 minutes of chronic cardio, and once you exceed about 60 minutes of hard workouts, you see an increasing risk of mortality. So those people who are doing like two-a-day hard workouts or those people who are going out and doing like a bike ride in the morning and a swim at lunchtime and a run in the afternoon, which I used to do a lot of when I was a competitive triathlete, they're probably shortening, not increasing lifespan. Yeah, yeah it's so true that more isn't always better and uh, there is like only a minimal effective dose that you can get away with. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but what about uh, sleep and uh, circadian rhythms? Those are probably the biggest ones that get neglected. Yeah, it, it varies just like diet. You know, you can look at a book like The Power of When by Michael Bruce or at genetic snips that dictate circadian rhythmicity. And we certainly see people who do a little bit better at night who probably in ancestral times would have operated quite nicely as a sentinel or a spy or someone you know, standing guard over camp at night. Mm. And we need those kind of people in society. I think they mm -hmm. comprise something like 10 to 20% of society. And most people kind of fall into that 9.30 to 11-ish PM bedtime, sometimes even slightly earlier, mm -hmm. you know, close to when the sun sets. And then sometime between like a 5 and 7 AM wake time with, in most cases, the highest amount of melatonin production and core cooling and Uh, glymphatic drainage and hormone production and neuronal repair occurring if you are in bed and getting close to being asleep mm -hmm. by about 10.30 p.m. And ideally, you've completed any hard workouts if you are doing those type of things or anything that's very sympathetic nervous system stimulating about three hours prior to bedtime. And then we see, you know, waking a large amount of morning sunlight or blue light exposure upon waking, large amount of red light exposure and absence of blue light exposure in the evening. Mm -hmm. And generally in most people about four to six sleep cycles during the night or, mm -hmm. or during any 24 hour cycle, you know, it might be, you know, three sleep cycles during the night and a fourth sleep cycle or a fifth sleep cycle while taking a nap during the day, right? There's even a coach who coaches professional athletes named Nick Littlehales And he, because his athletes travel a lot and some nights they're getting three hours of sleep and other nights they're getting 10 hours of sleep, for example, on a weekend, he simply ensures that they're getting about 30 to 35 sleep cycles during any given week, right? So there are a lot of different ways to track this, but ultimately, uh, absence of blue light at night, presence of red light in bed by about 1030, sleeping for four to six sleep cycles, and you can even measure sleep cycles using like an aura ring or, you know, sleep tracking device like that. And then waking up, getting a lot of sunlight exposure in the morning, uh, and then avoiding any sympathetic nervous system type of stimulation within about three hours prior to bedtime. Those are some of the things we see that can increase your circadian rhythmicity. Mm. Um, You know, and then of course there's normal sleep hygiene, right? Sleeping in a cold environment or taking a, a lukewarm or even a cold shower prior to bed to ensure that the body temperature is low. There are even devices like a chili pad that will circulate cold water under you while you're asleep. And I, I certainly like, and I, I use that. I keep my home at about 64 to 66 degrees while I sleep at night. Uh, and then of course, darkness is important. And Uh, limiting the bed to only sleep or perhaps sex or, you know, that's, that's a prudent idea as well. And then ensuring that you have absence of noise, you know, whether that be via foam earplugs or some type of white noise device that's placed in airplane mode next to the bed. You know, these are all normal sleep hygiene parameters, but you know, ultimately, yeah, circadian rhythm is very important. Probably some of the better books on sleep out there are the book Sleep by Dr. Nick Littlehales. Why We Sleep by Dr. Matthew Walker, The Power of When by Dr. Michael Bruce, and probably one of my favorites of late, a book by Dr. Sachin Panda mm. uh, about, uh, I believe it's called, you know what, I forget what it's called, The Circadian Code, I yeah, think yes. is the name of it. Yeah, exactly. But that's a really good book about circadian rhythm as well. So there's a lot of really good resources in this day and age when it comes to sleep. Yeah, that's true. And uh, you're also, I, th I think you're writing your own book, your next book in the same area 
Uh, my next book is more focused on anti-aging and longevity. Mm -hmm. There are certainly some pretty comprehensive chapters on sleep, uh, on nootropics and smart drugs and biohacking the brain. There's a lot in there on kind of like we touched on the minimal effective dose of exercise and the perfect workouts and even biohacks for workouts and exercise. It's a, I mean, it's about a thousand pages long right now. So there'll <laughs> be a lot that kind of goes to the cutting room floor or that winds up on my website. But ultimately, yeah, the book kind of is, it's about mind optimization, body optimization, and even quantum physics and spiritual optimization. You know, the importance of gratitude and love and belief, sound healing, um, you know, and, and, uh, and kind of a, a mixture of Chinese traditional medicine and Ayurvedic principles combined with Western medicine and biohacking and, and science. So I've been working on that book for, about a year and a half. And uh, yeah, folks go to bengreenfieldfitness.com and sign up for my newsletter. I'll be sending out a few newsletters prior nice. to the book's release nice. and kind of leading up to when it gets released. But I'm looking at, at winter of 2019 is probably when that book is going to get released. Okay, looking forward to it. But uh, which we, we, what do you think is the most important one for, for uh, longevity, like sleep, nutrition, exercise, or these things like relationships and uh, community? that we've been not talking about hormesis that hormesis. i mean over and over again we see that probably the two biggest things you see in fruit fly studies yeast studies rodent studies and even human studies would be the presence of mild hormetic stressors spread throughout the day including sunlight radiation exposure to heat exposure to cold exposure to hunger exposure to digestive stress or a body stress from the intake of, of like the wild plants and herbs and spices that present a mild stress to the body. That, that would be one thing. Uh, and, and exercise, of course, is considered a hormetic stressor as well, right? Like movement. Mm. Yeah. Um, and then that and reproductive usefulness or fertility, or like number of offspring produced or at least number of offspring that uh, is trying to be produced, you know, frequency of sex, um, frequency of interaction with the opposite sex and either number of children or number of sexual encounters. You know, I would say if anything, like, you know, don't be afraid to, to kind of like be hungry and to sweat and to be cold and to shiver every once in a while, or even go out of your way to do something like that every day and then try and have sex regularly or have a robust kind of like social life that even just includes lots of encounters with the opposite sex and those would be probably the two biggest things that mm. based on studies you could do for longevity. That's very interesting. Yeah. Like <laughs> it's, it's, it's as if like the uh, people who are exposed to these difficult situations and toughness, they, they're tougher to die. <laughs> so yeah. It's yeah. Harder, hard, harder to kill as we say over here in America. Yeah. Harder to kill. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How this is going to be the topic you're, you're going to be talking at the biohacker summit in Toronto, right? Or something similar. Yeah, I am going to be talking at the Biohacker Summit, and uh, yeah, it will it will be a lot of a lot of this type of information, uh, and and some some newer things that I'm researching right now in the realm of anti aging and longevity. So, yeah, I'll be I'll be presenting on some interesting things there. Nice, nice. We're actually organizing the Biohacker Summit in Tallinn uh, f with with Demo and and his team uh, in September as well. So, <laughs> it's going to be awesome. Ah. I like Tallinn. Tallinn's great. You, you, you know, were, if you go there, you not, were recently not here, right? Relish too much. Yeah, you need to go and eat at this restaurant, Old Hansa, up in Old Town. It's a medieval yeah. restaurant where they, you can eat bear and elk and uh, and wonderful uh, pork and all all manner of spiced wines and meads. And it's very Tallinn's a very cool kind of medieval town. I like yeah, it there. Yeah. Uh, nice scenery. Yeah, if you guys do the conference next year, keep me posted. I'm probably not gonna. Not going to be out there this September, but uh, yeah, I I love to get over to Europe. I think I'm actually speaking in Japan for most of September, so that's where I'll be. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we'll definitely keep you updated, and I'll, I'll, I'm I'm coming to the uh, Toronto event as well, so I'll see you there. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I'll see you at Spark. <laughs> yeah, uh, but uh, you also mentioned that uh, people can uh, sign up for your newsletter at your website. Are there any ways they can uh, come um, come or come into contact with you? 
Yeah. And I'm also on Instagram uh, and I, I tweet a lot of research studies too. So Twitter and Instagram, I post a lot of kind of like foods and recipes and workouts and things like that to Instagram at instagram.com slash Ben Greenfield fitness. And then on Twitter, I'm just uh, Ben Greenfield. So mm -hmm. yeah. And anybody who would like to, to learn a little bit or follow me, usually I try to, I try to be as helpful as I can. So yeah. Definitely. And really enjoy talking with you, Ben, and I'm uh, glad that you make it. And my la I'm going to ask you my last question, which is, uh, what would be this one piece of advice or a habit that you wish you adopted sooner that improved your body and your mind? Hmm. You know what? I don't want to kick the horse to death, but I would say fasting. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I have to be careful because there's a lot of, for example, like lean, skinny women who exercise too much who hear that and they're like, oh, I'm going to fast and still do my hot yoga and my spin classes and my yeah. crossfitting and my kettlebells. And, and, uh, no, like my wife fasts, but she, you know, her typical day of fasting, she's kind of like in the garden and fermenting some foods in the kitchen. And, you know, she might go to the gym once every one to two weeks. Right. So yeah, there's, there's a, there's, there's definitely a line that needs to be drawn, but ultimately yeah, I would say fasting, just being mm -hmm. a little bit more cognizant of, of hunger signaling, and the type of foods that I eat. And uh, I guess the last thing I would say is this, and then I have to go. Uh, but it would be, you know, fasting is not necessarily synonymous with caloric restriction. Right? Yeah. Like I, eat, I eat probably 4,000 calories a day, but I just have long periods of time that I go between eating. And sometimes I'll eat literally a 3,500 calorie dinner with half a bottle of wine, yeah. you know. That's but, I, but that might be after I haven't eaten since 10 a.m., right? So... So yeah, it's, I would say that fasting though would be probably the top thing that I would have adopted earlier. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> but yeah, thanks. Thanks Ben for coming on the show and uh, I'll, I'll see you in Toronto, I guess. Awesome, man. I'll see you there. Thank you for having me on and uh, goodbye everybody. <laughs> I'll see you around. All right. See ya. All right. That's it for this episode. Make sure you leave us a review on iTunes and other social media platforms. Also, if you're interested in participating the Biohacker Summit, whether that be in Tallinn or Toronto, then check out the links in the show notes. And uh, I'm definitely going to be participating in all of them. And it's going to be an amazing time. It's one of the best. It's the top biohacking and human optimization conference in the world. So the links are in the show notes. But other than that, thanks for listening. My name is Seem. Stay tuned for the next episode. Stay empowered.